Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fan cast. I am your host, Alex, and joining me as usual is Noel. I think that's the first time we've actually put a John Carpenter fan cast in the show. Have we? Yeah, I, it's my commitment to doing this differently every single time. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm going to write this down and have like a little template. And then I'm like, no, I'll remember. But I never do. <laughs> it's like my work password. I have to like reset it constantly. <laughs> uh, consistency is the refuge of the boring. That's true. That's <laughs> yes. true. Good point. And joining us for our third time is Julie Sidor. Hello, Julie. Hi. I'm a comic artist. My most recent work is on snowflamecomic.com. I'll be releasing some original stuff soon. And uh, you can find me at Julie Sidor on Twitter and Jay Sidor on Tumblr. Excellent. So let's move into Halloween 4. Now, is this a film either of you had seen before? Yes. Oh, yes. Many, many times. I have seen this movie three times now, I believe. I went through it after I learned that there was actually sequels to Halloween Beyond 2, which was surprising to me as a uh, young teen. There's a few more than Beyond 2. There is quite a few more. We've got a long <laughs> mm -hmm. way to go with the Halloween franchise. Yeah, so I watched through it, and I enjoyed it. Then I watched through it again, and I did not enjoy it as much. And then I watched through it last night, and uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Like I think I said in the last time I was on, I was a big fan of slasher movies. I still kind of am. So I, I rewatched this one quite a few times. Same here. I honestly, I don't think I've seen it since late 90s, probably. Mm -hmm. But this was one of those ones that throughout the 90s, when I got into slashers, I got into the Halloween series. This is one of those ones that I would watch a lot. One, two, and this, I would always watch a lot. Then H2O finally came out and I started watching that. Those three have always kind of been the core of my Halloween fandom, one, two, and four. But it's been a long time, so this is my first time watching it in probably maybe a little over 15 years. Moving into the film, after the disappointing performance of Halloween 3, Universal was no longer interested in continuing with the franchise, so talks began with canon films, of all people. Mm -hmm. With John Carpenter and Deborah Hill both still involved, John Carpenter potentially to direct. Carpenter collaborated on a screenplay with Dennis Etchison, who we remember as the author of the novelizations of The Fog, Halloween 2, and Halloween 3. We do. Sadly, remember. <laughs> <laughs> Their idea was that Michael Myers would return, but as a type of psychic manifestation as the town of Haddonfield has banned Halloween, but the mass repressed memories, as well as the new generation of youth's eagerness to experience that night, is starting to trigger a new wave of murders. Okay. He was going to go all weird meta-commentary and... Yeah, not sure how I feel about that. I think I did hear some things about that screenplay, but it's a little bit Michael Myers by way of Freddy Krueger MO there. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I have never been able to track down a copy. It's never circulated around. I know that there's one scene in this movie where, you know, the sheriff and Loomis suddenly find themselves surrounded by multiple Michael Myerses. And then it was used from that. Yeah, that was partially taken from a sequence in that. Otherwise, none of this really made it to the finished film. Because series producer Mustafa Akkad, who still controlled the majority stake, turned down the idea as too cerebral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it's also too much Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. Granted, it didn't stop this movie from being too much Friday the 13th, but we'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, washing their hands of it, Carpenter and Hill sold him what remained of their rights and walked, and with the exception of a little involvement that Carpenter had in H2O, they otherwise have no involvement with the remainder of the franchise from here on out. With the canon deal falling apart without Carpenter's involvement, Mustafa Akkad decided to finance it himself through his company Troncus International, as well as self-distribute through Galaxy International. It took a few years, with the finished project being released on October 21st, 1988, six years after Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. So the newcomer that was brought in to produce this film, and he would continue on for parts 5 and 6, is Paul Freeman. He primarily did TV movies from the 70s throughout the 90s, did a bunch of 60s cop shows, and was most popular for doing big miniseries epics like The Yellow Rose and North and South. 
Director Dwight H. Little was yet another alumni of the USC Film School, though not during the years when Carpenter was there, where he won numerous awards and acclaim for his student film Americano, which led him to additionally direct the films KGB The Secret War, Getting Even, and Bloodstone, which is what caught the eye of Akkad. After Halloween 4, he continued on with Marked for Death, Rapid Fire, Free Willy 2, Murder at 1600, Deep Blue, Anacondas 2, The Hunt for the Blood Orchid, and the adaptation of the video game Tekken, as well as the Sega CD video game Ground Zero Texas, and countless hours of television for shows such as Millennium, X-Files, The Practice, Law & Order, 24, Prison Break, Castle, Dollhouse, Criminal Minds, Nikita, Sleepy Hollow, Arrow, and Bones. So still an active TV director. There you go. The script has a whopping four writers just for the story alone, but three of those were just producers who came and went as this project kept circling around for years, and only little bits of their involvement made it to the finished film. This is the only writing credit for Donnie Lipsius, who largely produces and directs documentaries about time travel. (laughs) Larry Ratner primarily produces direct-to-video horror and thriller flicks like Dahmer, Gacy, Amnesia, Small Time, and a handful of other blandly generic titles. Mm -hmm. And Benjamin Rufner has zero other credits to his name. I have no idea who he is. So the last writer who also wrote the finished script is Alan B. McElroy. This was his first produced screenplay, though he was also a friend of Dwight Little from USC. And he went on to write Murder by Night, Wheels of Terror, Rapid Fire, Rolling Thunder, Spawn, both the movie and the animated series, Kurt Cameron's Left Behind, (laughs) Ballistic X vs. Sever, Wrong Turn, and The Marine. He also worked with Dwight Little again on Ground Zero Texas and Tekken. Due to the hasty production schedule and a looming Writers Guild strike, he wrote the entire script for Halloween 4 in just 11 days. Impressive. So the budget of the film was $5 million, and it pulled in a domestic gross of just under $18 million, making it enough of a hit that Part 5 was quickly greenlit. It topped the box office the week it was released, with the accused alienation, punchline, and gorillas in the mist rounding out the five behind it. Also released that week were Mystic Pizza and Tapeheads, neither of which cracked the top five. Halloween 4 held number one for one more week before finally dropping to fifth, when, of all things, John Carpenter's They Live came out and knocked it out. Okay. Nice. So another week later, Child's Play and Ernest Saves Christmas came out, and Halloween no longer (laughs) even appears in the top 15. So it had a good three-week run. Our story is about a sad little girl named Jamie Lloyd. Her parents, her mother being Laurie Strode, recently died in a car accident. She's struggling to settle in at a foster home, and nightmares and the taunting of her peers constantly remind her that she's the niece of the legendary killer Michael Myers. Amidst all this, she has to decide whether or not she's ready to experience the holiday of Halloween for the first time with her foster sister, Rachel. Meanwhile, Rachel's going through her own problems as she has to cancel a planned date to babysit the girl, which leads her to discover her boyfriend is cheating on her. Regardless, she and Jamie are quickly forming a close bond. Sadly, this is the Halloween Michael comes back. After spending years seemingly locked in a coma after the full-body burn of Halloween 2, Michael is ordered to be transferred to federal custody. This doesn't sit well with Dr. Loomis, also having survived Part 2 with bad burns and a limp, but it's not long before his warnings prove true when Michael kills the transport crew and starts paving a bloody wake towards Haddonfield. There, he quickly picks off all but a few cops and takes out phone and power lines as he sets about tracking down Jamie. Loomis arrives, and he and the surviving sheriff clear the streets in a curfew, but the drunken, manly patrons of Earl's Bar decide to wander the streets as a heavily armed posse, and it's not long before they gun down an innocent man. Loomis and the sheriff find Rachel and Jamie, and they all hole up in the sheriff's fortified home, along with a deputy, Rachel's cheating boyfriend, and the sheriff's daughter, whom he was cheating with. Those last three die when it's revealed too late that they've all sealed themselves in the house with Michael Myers. With Loomis and the sheriff having left on other missions, Rachel and Jamie are on their own until they're taken in by the posse who decide to drive them out of town while state police pour in. However, they don't realize Michael is riding beneath the pickup truck, and he starts killing them off too. The truck goes off-road, where Michael and Jamie share a moment before he goes for her, and the posse and state police show up and empty their guns on Michael, leading him to fall into an abandoned mine shaft, seemingly to his death. As the dust clears, Jamie and Rachel return to their family. As Rachel's mother draws a soothing bath, we cut to a first-person POV shot as a figure grabs a pair of scissors, slips on a mask, and closes in to attack her. Hearing screams, Loomis is enraged to see a bloody Jamie at the top of the stairs, dressed as a clown, scissors in hand, eyes coldly staring, just like young Michael all those years ago. So Alex, do you recommend Halloween 4? I do not. I watched it by myself late at night last night, 
At first, I'm like, you know what? I'm kind of on board. I'd like to see a slasher again. It's been a long time. It's a nice crisp hour, 22 minutes. Not too much of my time. I appreciate that on a lot of levels. I kind of like the intro. It was almost like a universal monster thing, which is like, Jesus doesn't live down here or whatever. Like that kind of dialogue that I just kind of <laughs> eat up, where it's just constantly about how this mental institution is hell and everything. Very kind-hearted towards people who suffer from, like, uh, schizophrenia and insanity. Obviously, it's super, uh, oh, what's the word? Exploitative? It's definitely exploitative. Uh, <laughs> but as the movie went on, it just became Friday the 13th, basically. It was a Friday the 13th film. It didn't have the same sort of, like, skill and execution that set the Halloween franchise apart from a lot of the other slashers. It didn't have that kind of, like, slow burn tension for me. It was just kind of a rote by the numbers slasher film. And by the end of it, I was just a little bit bored. If I had watched this in a group, however, with someone else, I might have had a different opinion. So, Julie, do you recommend this movie? Hmm. Are we allowed to do tentatives on this show? Yeah, and then we can talk it out and we'll do final thoughts later. Mm -hmm. You can be on the fence for the moment. I think if you're looking for a slasher movie, this is definitely a fun one. It has a little bit more heart to it than some of them do. But a lot of it felt a little bit more like a thriller than more like a horror. Just because you can kind of see where everything's going to go, especially the segment where Michael has escaped the ambulance and is trying to get to Haddonfield. Mm -hmm. Pretty much all of that, very predictable, very by the numbers. And a lot of it kind of just continued to feel like that way. Like, oh, who is he going to mow down next? Instead of the kind of anything could happen that the first Halloween did and some better slasher movies do. But this did have some traits of the original Halloween in that the characters are extremely likable, well, most of them, and you really root for them and you want them to escape. There's some strong points in that. But otherwise, there just wasn't enough suspense or surprise to like really bring me into this one. I want to recommend this movie. I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to or not. There's a lot about it that I do like. I like that it captures the kind of Haddonfield small town aspect. I like a lot of the stuff with Jamie and Rachel. It feels like another Halloween film. It feels like a nice continuation of the story. It's a bit rote of a continuation. I like Loomis. I like some other stuff like the town posse actually killing their own neighbors. It just, it was a rush production and it feels like a rush production in that it feels like a lot of nice stuff that they didn't stew on enough and really polish. Mm -hmm. And it's not very scary and it's not very suspenseful. I think maybe they cut it a little too tight. I also really didn't like Michael Myers in this one. Yeah. For me, it's a lot like my feelings for Halloween 2, though they're different, in that it does a lot of things that I really like and some things that disappoint me. I think I ultimately do recommend it, but very faintly. We'll see as we talk it over. Why don't we go ahead and just talk about, there is a visible influence of, while well, Halloween came first, by 1988, I want to say Friday the 13th was already on, what, their seventh or eighth installment? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can definitely see the influence that this has, and it's trying to compete with that now being the front runner in the market. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was as much room for slow burns. Yeah. I mean, the kills are more about what kind of weird thing can we do with each kill. Mm -hmm. Halloween was always more about Slash, just he has a knife. Yeah. And this is where he's impaling someone with a shotgun. Yeah. Were there that many other, like, weird kills in there? Like, I don't know. He killed the mechanic with a pipe or something, but right. I think it was mostly the knife. Well, we actually don't know because he kills a lot of people off screen, like the people in the ambulance and the people in the police station, where we just see the guy in the police station dismembered. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I remember that... He did kill that guy with his thumb. His thumb. So point to you. No. <laughs> yeah, he has two kills here. Well, he has three kills where he's just using his bare hands. Yeah. Two of which we see him literally rip into people. Like, you have the one where he's literally ripping the guy's head off. Like, geez, man. And then the one where he just jams his thumb between the guy's eyes. Yeah. Yeah, which makes it also very much more like Jason post when he becomes immortal by, like, number six at this point. He feels very superhuman. They make him so physically strong that there is literally nothing you can do against him. Whereas what I liked about him in 1 and 2 is he's not a very large man. Right. And he's a person that when you hit him, it's going to leave a mark. His thing is he just keeps getting up. Yeah. In this one, it's like he's literally a brick wall. He's Terminator. Yeah. He lets them hit him with their truck and he doesn't even really react to it. Exactly. And also the fact that he's going through and literally mowing out an entire police station. Right. 
I mean, that's scary in concept, but it just seems a bit ridiculous. Yeah, there's a lot of escalation in this. Like, his tactics are way too, like, ahead of the curve. He is taking out the power to the entire city. He's knocking out communications. He's taking out the entire police force. There's no fear anymore. You're like, well, this guy's death incarnate, so just let him do whatever he's going to do. He's almost comical. A little bit. He's almost ridiculous instead of threatening. Yep. Yeah, and his appearance is just generic enough that, yeah, it does come off comically. With Jason, at least he's really interesting to look at in most of them, like especially like in Seven. Yeah. Also, it's just this Michael Myers isn't really very captivating to watch. No. To be fair, like they don't give him any kind of interesting business. Like when he, you know, impales the woman with the shotgun. I was certain they would at least do a callback to when he kind of cocks his head like yeah. in the first movie. Like with Steve. I thought that was going to happen, yeah. Yeah. You know, at least that would have been a little business or something for him to do to kind of look cool, but he just wasn't terribly captivating throughout most of this. Yeah. That kind of made it suffer a little bit more, too. Because he's not supposed to be in the limelight. He's supposed to be in the shadows. You're not supposed to see him. He's supposed to be like the shark from Jaws. He drifts in and out. He's not supposed to be the Jason Terminator type figure. Right. They could have guarded how much he shows up a little bit more, but they really don't in this one. What I loved about the first movie was you had all those moments where he's trailing his victims. Mm -hmm. And so much of that movie is, even though it's not like directly from his point of view, it's we're following his point of view. Mm -hmm. He's a hunter. He is. They made him more like a force of nature in this, that he just literally sweeps into town and leaves everything bloody in his wake. He has no sense of stalking, timing things out. Because in the original, also what I liked is, even in part two, he would plan these kind of elaborate tableaus. He wouldn't just kill someone, he would use them to stage something. Mm -hmm. Set up a diorama, damn it. <laughs> yeah, when he came into the police station, there should have been some kind of display. Right instead of just torn bodies. Yeah, right. no, I agree with that completely. There's none of that sense of whimsy he had before that I always joked about. Yeah. I think the closest this came is when um, he confronts Loomis for the first time, and there's an actually a creepy shot of him just standing in the doorway looking at him. With the bandages on his face. Yeah. Right. They should have kept the bandages, by the way. It was way more effective than the mask. Yeah. Or wait a little longer till he gets the mask. Yeah. Exactly. Because there's all those people running around with them. Like, he could pick one other one up very easily. But even then, that whole confrontation with Loomis, the fact that Michael does nothing during it, mm -hmm. yeah. that he even just walks away and leaves Loomis there. That could have been a great moment. It should have been like, yeah, Loomis is like, if you're going to kill anyone, kill me. Visually show Michael just consider it and then just walk away and leave yeah. Loomis there. And that's when Loomis starts shooting after him. That was where the movie diverged from what I wanted it to be with yeah. what it became. Because after that, then it becomes explosions and dodging trucks right. and stuff. Yeah. And then the stuntmen that they got to play Michael, they wanted to get big guys, but instead of getting like Kane Hodder like bodybuilder guys, they just got big old school barrel chested stuntmen who, you know, not to insult them anyway, they just have this build that in that outfit made them look just kind of clumsy. Mm -hmm. Michael had no grace in this movie. No. Yeah. You know, in the original, he was played by a very thin man who had this kind of almost balletic grace to him. In the second, he was played by a stuntman, too, but he was kind of a smaller, like, Rottweiler type. <laughs> in this one, like, especially when he's up on the roof. Yeah. He looks like he can barely stand. <laughs> he's not threatening at all. And I do think, like, the whole force of nature thing, you kind of got to be a little careful when you play that, too. Because here, where it could be scary, it also takes away so much of the imagination. Right. I don't wonder about what he's capable of, what he's not capable of. I just assume that he can do it. And clear out a police station? Yeah, sure, he can do that. Whatever. Yeah. Survive getting hit by a fire truck? Yeah, whatever. If it was more unknowable, I think it would be more scary. Yeah. And kind of the mystery is supposed to be kind of one of the bigger things about Michael Myers. It's like playing a game with a kid. No matter what you do, like anything scenario you come up with, he's going to have like a force field. There's just no beating him, so there's no rules, and that makes it less scary. Right. I mean, that's what I liked about the first two movies. He felt like he was pushing on through sheer force of will. Right. But you could still feel that his body was taking punishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part two, he gets shot in the eyes. And he is not just pretending like that didn't do anything to him. He's literally clutching his face and blindly flailing around. Exactly. No, yeah. 
in part one when he gets stabbed at the wire hanger or when he gets stabbed in the chest he's showing visible damage it's showing that it is hurting him yeah no and that that's scary that's some creepy stuff there because it's just a little off enough from what a human can do. Right. There's a difference between a character who refuses to give up and a character who you just can't do anything to. Yeah. Yeah. That's the line that they crossed in this film. Absolutely. And then there's the mask. Yeah. Which, what did you think of the mask, Alex? Uh, it looked like a Halloween costume for a Halloween costume. Like, it looked like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll recreate the Michael Myers mask from memory. Here it is. It's foam, <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the story behind that. I will say everyone enjoyed making this movie from the behind the scenes thing, except the makeup guy who got in constant clashes with the producer. He was fired from this film, rehired, then fired, then rehired. <laughs> and once he was done with this film, he just decided to retire from the industry entirely. Oh. That sucks. Yeah. You also notice that Loomis, the burn makeup on his face, goes through three different incarnations. That's because after, like, they filmed it for two days, they're like, no, it sucked. Make a new one. Oh, no. So with the Michael Myers masks, they went to the company that made the original William Shatner mask, who still had the molds, and they said, can you press us, like, six fresh ones off of that mold? So they were the exact same copy of mask. But they didn't arrive until the day shooting began, and they arrived pink with blonde hair. <laughs> and you can see one shot in the school when Michael Myers attacks them and, you know, then the sister appears again with the fire extinguisher. You can see one shot where they had to shoot that day regardless, and he has one shot where he's wearing the pink mask with the blonde hair. They should have kept it. That would have been amazing. It actually does look slightly better because what happened was they then just had to really quickly paint them all white, mm -hmm. but they didn't get to do any detailing or anything like that. Yeah. And because they used the wrong kind of paint on that fabric, it dried in a weird way. Okay, that makes sense. So that's also why it's so bright. Then they literally had to get hair dye from the local drugstore to dye all the hair brown. They should have literally kept the pink because in reality, they would not produce that mask ever again. After the events in Haddonfield. It's true. They wouldn't sell the clown costume. They would not sell the Michael Myers mask. Well, what I like is that it's not the exact same clown costume. Yeah, I guess so. It does look a lot like it, with the, especially with the Michael Myers mask. And if they had like where they just changed it, we're like, oh, well, we had all these masks in stock, so we just painted them pink. <laughs> that would have been wonderful. <laughs> You know what would have been cool is you have that scene where it's that group of teenagers who are all dressed like him who decide to fuck with the sheriff for some reason. I can't even believe they did that. Those guys should have been shot. <laughs> yeah. What I would have done is have it be that, yeah, those are illegal costumes that teenagers aren't supposed to have. And that group of teenagers bought them because they want to be cool and rebels and all that stuff. And he kills one of them in order to get the mask. There you go. See, that makes sense. Yeah. We were talking, Julie, even like how they have those teenagers who fuck with Loomis in the car. Right, right. How come they aren't on the victim list? Exactly. They were cheerleaders. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> those guys were jerks. It felt like a film where they have all the pieces. They just didn't really know how to connect them all. No, for sure. I think that's largely the problem because they were in such a rush to get this made. It did feel right. like a series of reshoots. It was just like, we don't have enough. Let's get the bunch of guys going as a posse to go yeah. take on Michael Myers. All right, cool. It's exactly like Silver Bullet. Who cares? And this was greenlit and shot in August for an October release. Yeah. Wow. So they did this fast. Well, kudos to them. And this time, no messing around with those painted leaves. Like they show in the opening credits some shots of fall, cornfield, fall. Forget it. California. Everything's green. <laughs> <laughs> the Hollywood sign in the background. <laughs> Actually, they shot this in Salt Lake City, Utah. Oh, really? Okay. Well, Salt Lake City, looking good. Nice and green. <laughs> Again, they shot in August, like a month before it would have looked like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I did think a lot of the shots were framed very well. The lighting was definitely evocative of the first two Halloween movies. I thought yeah. there were a lot of things that were done really well, especially considering what a tight schedule they had. Yeah, and that's why I still recommend it, because I think for its limitations, there is a lot that they still do well, and you can tell that they are putting a lot of effort into it. Oh, yeah. No, there's a lot of love in it, for sure. I think with stuff like Michael, that was just, they didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Not so much that they aren't trying, but I think it's just they didn't fully click with what actually works about him. You know, yeah, I think the influence of the Friday the 13th movies and just coming from a place of love and being like, look, he's scary. Yeah, get the biggest stuntman you possibly can. That'll work out. 
And again, that's something that in like every other slasher movie that was made in that era, that's what they did. And in a lot of them, it worked and in a lot of them, it didn't. Yeah, your Texas yeah. Chainsaws massacres. It's something I don't fault them for. I just don't think it was the right choice. No. Yeah. I'm always surprised that this isn't a TV movie. I always think back of it and it feels like a TV movie to me. Like a faithful recreation of trying to recapture the Halloween spirit, mm. but it feels very, like, made for television. I think the kills are a little bloodier. Well, that's why I'm always surprised, because I'm like, that would yeah. be on TV. <laughs> you know, except for some of the kills and some of the things, though, around how Michael Myers was presented. I thought a lot of this movie did really well as something that could be a sequel to Halloween. Especially with how maybe some of the other characters were done. Just because, like, Jamie Lloyd. Like, so likable. Rachel is just absolutely lovable. You want them to do their best. You want them to succeed. And you really, really root for them. I love the relationship between them. Yeah. They just really gel. They feel like sisters. Mm -hmm. They are a large part of why I would recommend this. Yeah. The things about Halloween and a lot of John Carpenter films of having likable characters that are complex, that are just trying to go on with their lives. There is so much of that here. Mm hmm as well as, like, kind of the complicated background of, like, oh, there's these hicks. They're trying to be vigilantes in a Midwest town. The chaos <laughs> that's happening when they hear about this murderer's coming back. Like, all of that. All of that, I think, is, like, really good stuff. And I could easily mm -hmm. imagine a script like this being, like, what Halloween 2 could have been like if Jamie Lee Curtis's character hadn't had to go to the hospital. If it was instead, like, okay, we think we shot him. Here's the rest of your night taking care of the little girl from the first movie. I can visualize it just as easily. This is one where the title Halloween Legacy would have actually fit really well, because I love how Jamie is that whole, you know, what if you're the nephew of Hitler? You know, what's the struggle you have to go through with not only do you have to deal with, you know, your relative did this horrible thing, but everyone knows that you are related to the person who did this horrible thing and you just want to live your life. Right. And on top of that, your parents just died. And then also what I loved about the whole posse thing the posse thing is what they should have done in Halloween 2, especially with them straight up killing somebody, which I thought was a bold step to take. Yeah, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. I like that the sheriff called them beer bellies. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Like, it's total classic horror stuff where it's not just the monster that's the scary thing. It's how people react. Just playing a little bit into that. I think that was excellent. I really enjoyed that. And even like the teenagers surrounding the cop, like, no, you idiots. God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like in the second movie, they talked about, oh, no, there could be so many people that are Michael Myers just because of those masks. Yeah. And the police being afraid of that. Like, I think they worked with that again. And I thought that was really great. They could have even gone further with it. And I would have been on board for that. Also, in terms of the legacy thing, I like that there was one throwaway line where that bartender lost his son that Halloween. Mm hmm. But they never say who the son is. Was the son the guy who was stabbed onto the wall in part one? Was he one of the guys in the hospital in part two? Was he the guy who was walking down the street in the Michael Myers costume in part two who got killed? It was totally that guy. Right. Totally that guy. Yeah, I feel it too. That would be so poignant of his son was killed because people mistook him for Michael Myers. So he leads a posse that kills someone that he mistakes for Michael Myers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That is too poetic justice. <laughs> right. But as you were saying, with the town and chaos, I just don't think that they went there enough. What I wanted yeah, to see right. was like a Gremlins-esque town in like a full panic and then trying to navigate and catch this killer while everything's going on. But the town that they present is just empty. Yeah. Yeah, once they say the curfew's on. Then people just clear yeah. out, which is not what would happen. I mean, there was things like you say, like the posse of beer bellies running around, which is great. And the people in the mask trying to cause shit, even though they have absolutely no idea that Michael Marcy's actually running around. They just know that there's a curfew. But I do like those aspects for sure. And that's where it would have been interesting to see that original version that Carpenter and Edgerson were working on, where the entire thing is about town hysteria. Oh, yeah. To the point where just the mere mass hysteria is itself making everyone die. I would be curious to see if you could try to still capture that while still having the real Michael Myers in the midst of it all. Oh, yeah. That would have been fascinating. And I think that would have been the, like, scaling up that you kind of expect for a sequel. That would have been a great way to do it. 
And then just even tie it into, you know, Rachel and Jamie are being chased by Michael Myers and the police station's out and even anybody they ask for help won't help them because they're too busy dealing with their own problems. So Michael kind of has the advantage of that would have just been fantastic. And it's also the whole boy who cried wolf thing of they are dealing with so many fake Michael Myers that when the real one shows up. They just don't believe her. Yeah, that would have been great. Or even worse, they do believe her, but they won't help her because of the stigma of her being related to Michael Myers. They don't want to attract him. Yeah, they won't help her just because they're scared. You know, he's kind of a town legend. They don't want to deal with that either. I wouldn't want a diorama made out of me. (laughs) (laughs) That was also one of my bigger problems with the movie is instead of going out and further exploring that, It's not as bad as the hospital in part two, but once everyone holes up at the sheriff's house, we're just kind of stuck at the sheriff's house for, like, I want to say like a good 20, 25 minutes where nothing is really happening except everyone just kind of standing around waiting for something. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not really a scene that builds or anything. Actually, originally the sheriff was supposed to get killed in that house too. Okay. But his scene was deemed too expensive, so they just decided, no, he'll go out and deal with the posses. Well, if we're going to do that, can we follow him going out and dealing with the posses? Yeah, yeah. Because that sounds more interesting than watching people waiting at the house, yeah. I mean, it's like, once he starts killing in the house, it's interesting. But it just takes so long of everyone just sitting around. And then that the audience is just sitting there like, we know he's in the house. Yep. Yeah. Do something in the house. Yeah. Because then it all becomes about Kelly, Brady, and Rachel. Yeah, the love triangle. Yeah. Yeah. The love triangle, and then that weird, uninteresting pseudo arc for Brady. Yeah. God, Brady was done so weirdly. And even that shot where he's killed, he does like a spit take. Yeah. And then continues to be strangled by Michael. I would love to know the story behind that. Like if he had a mark that he had to do as an actor and then he forgot and he's like, oh shit, get that in there. (laughs) Okay. Strangle, strangle, strangle. I really don't care about Brady. Yeah. He's such a loser. Yeah. <laughs> even, in, even in death, what does he achieve? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he stops Michael for five seconds. I mean, I think you and I said that of all the characters, him and Kelly most came out of a Friday 13th film. Right. Yeah, because they're assholes right. that lack empathy. <laughs> They're fodder. Yeah, they're definitely fodder. I don't know, but it did feel like the movie was trying to make a little bit more of it. Like, it gave him this chance at redemption to, I guess, try to protect her, but... uh, (laughs) No. I thought the actor was interesting to watch, but writing for the character, they didn't really give him anything. No. Yeah, and also, speaking of that segment, we should remember, cops do it by the book. That's a gross t-shirt to wear when your dad's a cop. (laughs) (laughs) It is. And here's the thing. Is that even her dad's shirt? Yeah, that's what we (laughs) we were saying. Like, I would think, like, if my dad was a cop, I would not want to wear a shirt like that. Yeah, you don't want to talk about them having sex, unless you're a cop yourself. Or also, if my dad had a shirt like that and was a cop, I don't know that I'd want to be in that house. Like, what is that? And then I definitely went, like, oh, God. And then she's just wearing it, and then... What was going on there? Just find a park, guys. Find a park. (laughs) She's the swinging bachelorette who wears her swinging bachelor dad shirts. Yeah. Yeah, And just that was a funny shirt for a few seconds. And then it got really uncomfortable because you just keep thinking about it. Like, what does that mean? And whose shirt is that? (laughs) And then the entire time when her dads come home and all these people are coming with him, she never puts on pants. We're like, put on some pants. Like, dude, there's all these people over. Put on some pants. And (laughs) (laughs) never. (laughs) Hey, you want to be comfortable. Uh. (laughs) There's an additional bit in the script where then she starts trying to hit on the deputy, which is why she brings him coffee. Oh, my gosh. No. No. (laughs) But, like, you could make a small portion of a drinking game for this movie out of times when they cut away from her wearing the shirt. And no pants and talking to people and then cutting away and then she's still not wearing pants and talking to like random strangers. Like, ah! yeah, there would be four times you would have four opportunities to drink. (laughs) I just wish that she had lived long enough to be in the back of that truck riding with no pants. (laughs) There we go. Yeah. You know what I also thought would have been cool is when the sheriff comes home and starts arming everybody. We find out that she's like also a crack expert with guns. You know, she like grabs up a shotgun for each arm. Yeah. That would have been cool. Have her be the one who goes down fighting, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would have been awesome. But no, it's Brady. Let me just go back to Rachel and Jamie here a bit. 
I did really like how they felt so normal and relatable and how there was a really genuinely good bond between them. They just wanted to have a happy Halloween. Mm -hmm. I like that Rachel was still thinking of teenager things. She wanted to go out with her boyfriend, but then when the opportunity to do the right thing came up, she did it. I mean, grudgingly, but she did. So it just kind of fleshed her out a little bit. Yeah, no, I I really liked them. I actually like that they could have just as easily thrown in some arc where the first half of the movie, they're just bickering at each other and then they get along towards the end of it. This one, they just get along great through all of it. And I am totally cool with that. Yeah, it raises the stakes. Like they're so interesting and charismatic to watch that. Yeah, if I think things had been handled a little bit better on like Michael's end, this would be a really, really great slasher movie. I would totally recommend it. You know, maybe if some of the action was a little bit sharper and a little bit more suspense, then yeah, it'd be a fantastic slasher movie, especially with their strengths added to it. But uh, I don't know. My other big problem is that the climax is just kind of weak. I mean, not the actual ending ending. We'll get to that. But the big final confrontation with Michael where, you know, you have all this stuff going on. Rachel just keeps slamming him over and over with the car, which is fine. But then you have the whole abandoned mine shaft and everyone just shows up and empties guns into him and he just falls into the ground. And that just kind of came out of nowhere. And it's like, honestly, I would have just gone with the ending that they did for H2O here. She uses the car to ram him up into a tree and then cuts his head off or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or blows his head off. You know, because they set up the shotgun and, and repeatedly reference a shotgun that never gets to be used against him. Run into him repeatedly, blow his head off with a shotgun, you know? Keep it personal between those two sisters. Yeah, just put yeah. the shotgun in his mouth. Because she's technically his adoptive sister now. Her foster. Because, uh, yeah, technically, Jamie hasn't been adopted by this family. Her parents just died a couple months ago and she's just in foster care at the moment. She going to get adopted real soon. But I like how it's a very, very nice foster home that is trying to be as welcome and warm as they can. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Well, it just makes you care about them, which makes you actually care about the stakes. Like, with Friday the 13th, it's basically just like a ride, basically. We're just like, okay, people are going to get killed Mm -hmm. in weird ways, and that's going to be that. And I don't care about these people. With this, it adds to the chase, where you actually want them to get out, rather than what kind of weird garden tool is the killer going to use to kill this person. And I like that there is that human struggle that was always kind of the anchor to the good Halloween movies. Mm -hmm. Which is something that I felt, you know, with a few exceptions, Friday the 13th kind of largely lacked not that every friday the 13th was dumb and empty they did have some good characters within there but halloween always had this nice anchor point with michael's family Mm -hmm. right and how it's this really twisted family that's turned on itself yeah i i wish that there had been some more involvement with the two sisters killing michael and that kind of resolving it like just some more involvement rather than uh, our beer bellies showing up and just shooting him That if he was attacked by his own family, that somehow that would feel more final and like something that could actually stop him compared to being shot up by some vigilantes and falling in a mine shaft. Because come on, he's already been on fire. He could survive that. And he's done falls. He could survive that too. Yeah, and also that the whole rolling over the truck is done by Rachel, not Jamie. Yeah, but if Jamie had done just almost anything, shoots him somehow, anything, that that would have felt like something that could really stop him somehow. I don't know. It's a little bit dream logic-y, but that would feel like a better resolution than what we got, which would have made the very next part that Noel wanted to talk about even more interesting. You know, let's go ahead and talk about where Jamie ends up following in the footsteps of Michael in the big climax when she dons the mask and grabs the scissors. Yeah, yeah, it kills her foster mom. Big thumbs down from me. I didn't like it. She literally replicates Michael's origin, almost. Right. I think that's actually a really great twist. I do too. There's really no sense to it, but what I love is there was really no sense to why Michael did what he did to begin with, too. Exactly. Yeah, I'm just gonna stand by. If she had had a hand in sort of even just air quotes killing Michael Myers, that would have made it that much more poignant when she kills again. Just because that, dream logic-wise or whatever, it feels much more believable of her taking on his sickness, evil, whatever, than just walking over to him and touching his hand. I think that they were trying to establish that something was happening with her because of those prophetic dreams, but we didn't really see much of a connection between her and him, and that's fine. She only really had the one dream. The one in in the costume shop was actually Michael. That's right, yeah. Although she had that flash of him as the clown, the little child Michael. Yeah. I know I criticized this when we watched it, but I'm actually kind of coming around to her not taking part in stopping him because I love the idea of she is the innocent lamb that this entire group is fighting 
fighting to protect from the monster. Right. Who then becomes the monster herself. And then the ones who are screaming as they witness this are Loomis, the sheriff, Rachel, all the ones who fought to save her from the monster. Right. By, like, having a hand in killing Michael. Like, I don't mean, like, no, no, she's no. going all Tommy Jarvis, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. on him or anything. I just mean, like, maybe she sets up something. Like, she acts as bait, whatever. Just almost anything than what she did. Daniel Harris shaving her head, just whacking him with a machete. Try to remember, Michael. Try to remember. <laughs> I still have yet to see that film, but I've seen that scene. It's honestly like Friday the 13th does have some weird, surreal, interesting parts to it sometimes. Tommy was the interesting through line to at least the middle of that series. Yes. It would have been cool to have him go from like that to becoming the Loomis. That would have been interesting. That would have been very interesting. Yes. Why don't we talk about Donald Pleasance's Loomis? Ah, always a delight. He gives 110. Yep. Yeah. Great performance. Consummate professional. I love that he got a smile a little bit when he was with that doom preacher. <laughs> the doom preacher. Like, you could just tell, he's not religious. But he relates to this guy. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, I tell people what's wrong all the time, too, and they don't listen to me either. I'll drink some whiskey. It is all fire and brimstone, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I love how he's just, like, delighted by it. It's such a human moment. Yeah. That was a great moment. Any of his interactions with Jamie, like those two were great. They don't even really have that much to do with each other. But yeah, even that that scene where he just like slumps over. (laughs) Hello, evil. Yeah, evil, yes. (laughs) I actually love that bit when they're in the school. And I love how in breaking into the school, they set off the alarm. Right. What I love is they're in the school and he's trying to comfort her by saying, it's okay, the state police will be here. And she's like, you don't think that's going to make a difference, do you? And you're like, no, probably not. Yeah. And he just sounds so tired. Ugh, Donald Pleasant. Just always a delight. I love how they get to the wreck of the ambulance. He's instantly in the water walking over to it. Yeah, he knows. Yeah. He knows. I do really like that confrontation with him. I still think it could have been staged a little better on Michael's side, but that confrontation in the diner where he just starts pouring to Michael his feelings. Yeah, no, that would have been just excellent if they had just done something on Michael's end to do with it. Like, Michael has some pretty intricate plans in this one, from sitting in the rocking chair as a decoy, to hiding on people's trucks. Taking out the entire power and phone. Power and phone, and a police department. You know, you can almost wonder, did he just leave Loomis just to let him survive, just to have him dangle again, or just to stir up the trouble that he wanted to make things a little bit easier for himself? I'd love to know if there was some kind of connection there, if any, but I don't know. The way it's staged, it just feels like Michael's like, you know what, I got stuff to do. I got to go shopping for a mask, for starters. Mm -hmm. I actually liked what you said earlier about how it would have been cool to draw out Michael heading to town. Yeah. Make it more this looming storm in the distance that's approaching. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like with the tableaus, you could have come to the diner. There was a diner attached to the gas station, which they cut a lot out of that. There were supposed to be like five people there that he killed. Right. Have a tableau where they're all sitting at the counter in a very creepy way, you know? There's so much you could have done with nobody quite knows where Michael is except for Loomis. And as he goes, it's just, yep, found that, found that. Found that. Oh, found him still right. doing that. Yeah, just kind of building up the dread. And when he gets to town, Bucky, the power station operator, is killed. And then the police station is all wiped out. They kind of just needed to shock the audience again and just have us like wondering, like, what is he? You know, maybe the thumb killings did a little bit of that for me, but, but it <laughs> needed more. There need to be more slasher films about killers who just use their thumbs on people. Yeah, like, I'm pretty sure Jason does that in one of them. But yeah, yeah. I just want a killer who is just called All Thumbs. All Thumbs. And he's a killer who just every single kill he does is with his thumb. Oh, come on, Noel, the hitchhiker, please. Yes, yes, yes. He baits him with his thumb, and then he ends him with his thumb. That was what the hitcher was missing. Yeah, I needed that one, too, thumbing. <laughs> Alex, any thoughts? Uh, no, I agree with what you guys are saying. Okay. Another thing I wanted to mention was the score. Alan Howarth is the guy who's been collaborating with Carpenter ever since Halloween 2. He's really the only Carpenter crew that they brought in for this. When he's just doing, like, atmospheric horror soundscapes, it's fine. It's generic, but it's fine. It works perfectly well. He still has no clue how to do the Halloween theme properly. (laughs) I even listened to the entire score CD. He keeps laying in a disco drum beat on it. Hmm. 
It sounds like the Assault on Precinct 13 disco remix. Yeah, I could see that. I, I remember oh, liking it better when I was younger because it had that driving beat to it, but it also doesn't right. have that original kind of menace or spareness to it. All right. And then when you get to the posse running around, he has the Halloween theme, but played in a kind of dinky fashion <laughs> with a silly snare drum under it. Yeah, that was a little bit stranger. And that's a conversation we've had in the past, Alex, with like Halloween 2, where when Howarth came in, he was all bragging in the special features, and he was in the special features on Halloween 4 too, about how he added a rhythm and a beat to the <laughs> Halloween theme. The whole thing about the Halloween theme is that the plunking theme itself is the rhythm and the beat, and the yeah. fact that it's actually off rhythm there are yeah. slight odd pauses in it, is actually what makes it eerie. Right. And by setting it to a rhythm and having a drum beat going under it, he eliminates so much of that. Yeah. And I think it would have been fine, but it needed some moments where they actually played it a little bit truer to the original yeah. there. Just give us a couple where it's just creepy and menacing. There were a few bits where he was doing some of the other scores from the original one, you know, like that old one was like, bum, 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 bum where he sounds like he's trying to play things slightly off key, but he's doing too good of a job of it. So he sounds like an eight year old a month into their piano lessons <laughs> mm. <laughs> instead of creepy. Gotcha. It's not a bad score. It's again, he just doesn't quite get it. And by the way, he's going to be doing the scores for the next two as well. So. All right. Good to know. Overall, I still ultimately do recommend it. It gives me enough. It gives me enough that I still enjoyed watching it. I will watch it again. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it entirely on its own, but as a sequel to Halloween, it holds a similar place to me that 2 does, in that it's nowhere near as good as the first, but it does enough as a continuation that I still kind of dig it. And I do, I really like Jamie and Rachel mm -hmm. and where they go with some of it. Compared to what's coming, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. Any final thoughts from either of you on it? Another one of my horror movie rules is adhered to, if you're unconscious, you do not die. Yeah, where the killer will just leave you? Yeah. Yeah. They're like Tyrannosaurus Rexes. It's true. I've got a big final thought, and the elephant in the room. Where does this film fit into the continuity? Because it does not really link up with two, because Michael was immolated. Well, they're all burned, and you do have a line about how Loomis set him on fire, and they both almost burned to death in the process. Yeah, but when you watch two as recently as we did, it's they were yeah. toast, both of them. And it doesn't really fit in with the next one, because isn't Rachel still alive by the next one? Well, the, Rachel wasn't the one who was stabbed. That was their mom. The mother was killed. Oh, I see. I would have been so angry if she had killed Rachel. Yeah. That would have been poignant, but I would have been so angry. <laughs> <laughs> and I should point out that the guys who made this movie, the writer and director, were planning to do a part five where Michael is dead. She did kill her mother. And now it's Loomis trying to prevent her from becoming the next Michael. That's how it was supposed to go from this point on. Interesting. That sounds really interesting. And we're going to find out that none of those really happen next time. Yeah. But I would be curious to know, like, how exactly are you going to prevent that? Are we actually going to finally see Dr. Loomis trying to have uh, therapy sessions? Because we've yes. never seen that. Yeah, we haven't. No, even whenever we've had, like, the TV cuts of 1 and 2 had some flashbacks where they showed young Michael and Loomis. Yeah, it's mostly just him staring. I feel like he's not a very good therapist. <laughs> no. It's one of those things where you don't know. No, but you can actually have it. Rachel is the one who's trying to save her, and Loomis is the one who's always being like, it's pointless, I've been down that road before. Evil. <laughs> oh, see, that would be really interesting. And yeah... I love Dr. Loomis, but I guess I would wonder how good of a psychologist can you be if you're flat out telling people he's evil and expressing them to believe you. Kill yeah. my patient you before know? I kill him and he kills you. <laughs> like, he's not even trying to dress this. He's a bit of a defeatist. Yeah. Yeah. But we have not seen what he has. <laughs> well, that's what I like is he's Van Helsing. Oh, yeah. he's definitely Van Helsing, yeah. He's been down this road before. Yeah, and Captain Ahab. Yes, yes, absolutely. But in terms of the continuity, Alex, there were some bigger ties. You don't see it, but in the photos, there was also another picture where we see Jamie's father, and it was the guy from the hospital in part two, the guy played by, uh, crap, what's his name? Was it Lance Guest, the guy from Last Starfighter? Okay. The original opening title sequence was supposed to be a shot slowly going down a corridor where there's this glowing flame coming from a room at the end of the hall, and then suddenly this explosion would happen of fire. And the body of Loomis would be shot out. Wow. 
And so that would show that he was thrown out of the room by the explosion that engulfed Michael. Okay. Okay. And they just didn't film it because of budget reasons. Makes sense. Okay. And then I know in H2O, there were going to be references that they did even film to her having the daughter of Jamie before they decided to just kind of not reference that at all. Because hmm. they could never come up with a proper explanation for why she would leave her daughter behind when she faked her death. Right. By seven, none of this will matter anyways. <laughs> and then also, I should point out that Tommy and Lindsay from the original film, their characters are in this movie too. Like Rachel's friend in the car who picks her up is Lindsay. I see. Oh yeah, that's right. And then you didn't get a name drop of him, but the two guys that are with Brady in the, in the shop, you have the one guy who takes the money and goes to try to hit on Kelly. The other guy is Tommy. Okay. Which is going to be completely retconned out because then Paul Rudd's coming back as Tommy. Which is amazing. I know Lindsay's back in part five. I know that character actually has more of a role, but I don't remember much of it. And we'll get to part five when we get to part five. This is one of those slasher movies where, I guess of like all slasher movies, where people just die on impact. Like no one ever takes longer than three seconds. As soon as something impales them, they're dead. Except for, of course, Michael. Right. Well, I don't know that I agree with that because Kelly, yes. But granted, she was stabbed with a very large tube. <laughs> Brady certainly took a while to go down. That's true, but he was choked out. Well, his neck was being snapped, but yeah. Yeah. And then his face. Yeah. The mechanic certainly died quickly. Seemed like the ambulance people died quickly, although we did not see a lot of that. Well, when you get a thumb in your brain... That's true. We still, again, very few people that we actually see killed in this movie. No, it's yeah. true. I mean, like the sheriff's deputy, we just find his body. Mm -hmm. Right. The other people in the ambulance, we just find their body. You know, all the police officers, we just find their bodies. The dog even had a scene in the script where he's getting killed. We just see the body. Yeah, right. in the closet, yeah. I mean, the sheriff, his big death was supposed to be like the way that Brady goes down. Mm -hmm. Imagine the sheriff doing that in the midst of a basement that's on fire. <laughs> Ooh. And even after Michael leaves him down there, a flaming sheriff pulls himself up to try to continue fighting Michael until he sees his own dead daughter and just gives in to the fire. Oh, that would have been a really great ending for that character. Yeah. Oh. And again, they just didn't have the money for it. And yeah, and I do kind of get that some of the things we talked about that could have made it more interesting, made it more intense, couldn't be helped because of budget reasons. But again, I think that also speaks to the making Michael super powerful. Mm -hmm. Like he is literally has the power of a grizzly bear. Right, right. Or ten tigers. He'll just stick his hand in you. Yeah. Yeah. That just speaks to also to the mishandling of Michael and the misunderstanding of Michael. Yeah. And that's where I'm going to be curious to see five and six, because I really have so little memory. I mean, like, I remember what happens at me, but I have so little memory of all the specific details, like in terms of what are the deaths? How do they handle Michael and the deaths? How do they handle all the character stuff? Like, I remember basic things about what happens with Daniel Harris in the next one, but so little of the specifics. I don't even remember what happens to Rachel in the next one, but I know she's in it. Mm -hmm. Those will be topics for future episodes. Absolutely. Coming soon. I'm trying to remember... They did some shooting in the same area. Don't they even reuse the same school? They filmed this in the exact same town as part five. That's what I thought, because when I saw the school, I thought like, oh, yeah, and then there's going to be this scene and this scene and this scene. And then they were like, why deal with it? And then they left and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but doesn't all this other stuff happen? <laughs> Let me just check your Halloween 6 real quick. Oh, Halloween 6 was filmed there, too. Oh, okay. So yeah, so apparently Salt Lake City, Utah becomes Haddonfield for a rather long stretch of time. But anyways, Julie, now that we've discussed it, do you have any thoughts on where you stand on the movie? I don't know. I uh, I still feel like a little bit on the fence. So, hmm. It's one of those ones where it kind of depends on when you see it. When I discovered the Halloween franchise when I was younger and started burning mm -hmm. through all of them... There's going to be some really awful ones in there, but, you know, this one, part two, they did stick with me more than any of the other sequels did. Mm -hmm. And having rewatched them, they still stick with me, even though I have problems with them. I can light recommend. Jamie and Rachel feel like classics. Loomis, yeah. Yeah. Jamie and Rachel feel like a proper addition to the series. Yeah. Yeah. We'll discuss where they go with them, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. And just how the action is laid out is probably my biggest beef with the movie. Somehow it needed to be staged to have a little bit more suspense to it. Maybe a little bit of handling of Michael. But other than that, like even after, well, they couldn't have done anything about the weird mask things. But mm -hmm. the casting, whatever, I wouldn't have even cared if some other stuff had been a little bit more on my alley. So yeah, light recommend. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, and it's one of those ones where if you would just want a movie to watch, probably not, because you can't really yeah. watch it on its own. Right, right. On its own, it's just kind of a generic slasher movie. But as a legacy sequel, if you like the first one and you want to know which of the sequels are yay or nay, I would put this on the yay. Yes, I agree. I just want to briefly mention, there was a novelization of this film by Nicholas Grabowski. It was the last movie to be novelized for the series. There's an interesting story behind it because this has been one of those holy grail collectibles of the fandom because it sold really, really well when it came out. It was a bestseller, but it had a very small print run and was never reprinted. So copies of this book were incredibly hard to find for a long time. Like, I became a Halloween fan in the early 90s. I've been collecting novelizations since the early 90s. You could not find a copy of this book for less than like 400 bucks. Wow for years wow but then it finally came out again in i want to say like 2001 as like a special edition anniversary release and even that sold out and used copies within a year were going for like 100 bucks yeah wow. keepers so i still couldn't get it then they finally put out another anniversary edition 10 years later and finally made a large enough print run that it's no longer a hard to find book the sad thing, though, is that version that's been published, despite being a high-priced collectible release, it's like 20 bucks. they ran the original paperback through a scanner and did a very poor job of proofreading it. Oh, no. Someone ran a spell checker on it, but it is littered with formatting errors, a lot of weird mistakes. Someone needed to sit down and proofread that book. But, I mean, as an adaptation... It's not bad. It is the movie. Okay. It doesn't go all Dennis Hutchison and try to make a weird twisted psychoanalysis of the movie. Right. Nick Grabowski, this is the only novelization he wrote. It was done early in his career. He's since gone on to be a horror writer, but nothing he's ever written has ever sold as well as this one did. So he's kind of had this interesting relationship with it where he fully admits it was just something that he hacked out early in his career for money that he just brought in like a month. Mm -hmm. But he still enjoyed doing it because he was a fan and he's been very loving that the fandom held it up as much as they did, has invited him to conventions for it. Aww. They had a, a Halloween anniversary convention where he got to share a table with Dennis Etchison. Oh, very nice. Do a big panel just talking about his book and his career. He just seems like he's very proud of what it means to people and everything. That's great. In terms of the book itself, it's perfectly well written. If you like the movie, if you like novelizations, it's a perfectly enjoyable read. The only real major differences are the old preacher guy sticks around. Ooh. There's a bit where the posse finds him where he's run into Michael and is so aghast at the mere sight of Michael that he's gouged his own eyes out. Really? And so Michael just left him there. I could imagine Michael Myers having that reaction where he's thinking of how to kill this guy and the guy just rips his own eyes out and Michael's just like, okay, there you go and walks away. Yeah. If you want to do my job for me. <laughs> Yeah. I really like that. And he's still alive, but he saw the face of perdition. I like that, yeah. And then the other thing, and I wish I could find where it was here just so I could read it off, is Jamie, after her and Rachel fell off of the house, she has a vision of her mother appearing to her. Okay. And it actually reminded me a lot of the bits of when Michael would see his mother in the Rob Zombie. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then there's one final bit there when she takes on Michael's form. The line is, Michael lives. Somehow he'll always live. Even if he didn't survive the assault of gunfire in the fall, Michael lives. He lives because now he lives in me. Wow. Oh. Michael can't die to the point where he'll just not die in someone else when he dies. <laughs> all right. It's a good adaptation. I'm glad I finally got to read it after all these years. It's not really quite the holy grail that it was built up as, but it's a perfectly fine novelization. Just, I hope they release a future edition where they actually proofread it. But overall, I don't really think I have anything else to really add about Halloween for the return of Michael Myers. Thank you again for joining us, Julie. Thank you for having me. Alex, you and I will be returning next month with Prince of Darkness. I'm excited. Thank you for listening to Masters of Carpentry. Have a great Halloween. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com.
Iris is in the room as well. Ooh. Iris, say hello. <laughs> nope, no dice. <laughs> You were a little bit crackly a second ago, Noel, but you're pretty good now. Okay, that's because my web browser has stopped loading. Ah. So I have nothing else interfering with the internet. Excellent. Until my mom goes and sits down and starts using her computer. <laughs> Stop her! <laughs> <laughs> Jump in front of her. Okay. <laughs> Just do the Loomis drape. Evil! <laughs> Evil! <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like a cat. Just drape yourself <laughs> over a small child. <laughs> She'll think it's night. <laughs> That's just how Loomis says hello. Oh. Just suddenly drape on someone and say, evil. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween 5, the revenge of Michael Myers. This time, it's, per well, it's actually personal all times. Yeah, it's always personal. <laughs> I always yeah. wanted to kill that family. With him, it makes sense. With a great white, not so much. Yeah, no, not really. 